you got to look at the draft treaty just like everybody else. There's no question that there's plenty of reason for gun owners and for the industry to be concerned. Yeah, I see two or three really big problems with the treaty as it's drafted right now. We have to bear in mind that there'll be a new draft coming out in the not too distant future, we think. But right now, this draft, I would say, is unacceptable from the U.S. point of view. And unacceptable, and I know for a lot of reasons. Uh, we were talking um, to Tom Mason yesterday, the concern about civilian ownership, the concern about ammunition. You also talked about another important issue. Well, to me, the single biggest problem with the treaty as it's drafted right now is it says that every few years, every five years, there'll be a review conference of all the states' parties to the treaty. So everyone who has signed the treaty gets together and looks at the treaty and tries to improve it. And right now, the treaty can be amended by a two-thirds majority vote of all of the signatories. So that means that if the U.S. were to sign and ratify the treaty, in five years it would go to a review conference, and then it would be up to a two-thirds majority vote of the states around the world uh, whether or not this treaty would continue to respect our Second Amendment freedoms or just the foreign policy interests of the United States in general. So what I hear you saying is, as we've said before, this treaty is really just the start of what the U.N. hopes to achieve and to get the U.S. on board with it. Yeah, this, this two-thirds majority vote idea is extremely sinister. Uh, it is utterly unacceptable from the American point of view. It poses incalculable risks to the Second Amendment, to the, the foreign policy freedom of the United States, to anything that the treaty covers. There's no conceivable way the United States can accept a treaty with this kind of provision in it. It just can't. Yesterday, Tom Countryman from the U.S. delegation, he, he made very clear, and I'm quoting him, he said, there are items contrary to U.S. law in this. But I've got to ask you, Ted, when push comes to shove, does that mean that the U.S. won't sign on to this treaty if those issues of self-defense, which we will talk about, and ammunition are still in there? Well, it's ultimately for the U.S. delegation to decide. I think that the issue of the two-thirds amendment would be a killer problem for any American administration, any American delegation. It's just unacceptable. The question of ammunition, the question of uh, licensed firearms owners, those two, I think, are very close to being veto issues for the United States. But we'll have to see how it works out. Talking about civilian ownership, still very much included in the treaty. What did you take from the, the, the way they described it in the preamble? The language is really dangerously ambiguous, I think. On the one hand, the preamble of the treaty recognizes national and constitutional regulation, but it does, it does so in the context of allowing the state to regulate firearms, which is not what we're looking for. Then it recognizes activities like hunting, sport shooting, cultural and historical things, but not in the context of constitutional protections. What it really says is that legal activities with firearms are things that are legal, which is not terribly helpful, slightly redundant. As you know from the start, though, what did we hear from the UN and all these other countries that are on board with this treaty? This has nothing to do with your Second Amendment. This has nothing to do with civilian ownership. And yet they still fail to put it in writing, as John Bolton stressed so many years ago. If you don't want to include it, put it in writing. Well, Ambassador Bolton is quite right about this. If the treaty is not supposed to include domestic transfers, and it's not supposed to be about individual end users, and right now the draft of the treaty is shot through with comments about individual end users, which means individual firearms owners, then take it out of the treaty. It is really a very simple problem to solve. The fact that this language keeps on propping up, keeps on popping up, just indicates that at a minimum, you've got some states that are very unclear on what's going on here. And at worst, I fear, it's this continuation of a UN resentment and dislike of private firearms ownership. And I think that's so true because how many times have we heard them talk, and, and all these different groups here, come and talk about the importance of human rights to this treaty. But you look at this treaty right now, and is it really going to do anything to stop what we are seeing in Syria and around the globe, these horrendous murders and, and abuses? I mean, is there any way that this treaty is really going to no, do that? No, not in the slightest. And, you know, for that matter, I support human rights, too. And one of the, human, one of the human rights I support is the, the inherent right of personal self-defense. That is a human right. And there are others, of course, that matter quite a lot. 
But this treaty is not going to do anything to, to protect any human rights. What it comes down to is that this treaty says it's about enforcing human rights standards. It's a treaty. If you actually want to enforce something, you don't need a better law against murder. You need cops on the beat. That's how you enforce the law. All of this is treaty making, it is law writing, it is words. Words and laws are only available to places that are actually law abiding like the United States. And they're meeting behind closed doors right now trying to hammer out a final document. Uh, the way it's written right now, you just said, it's so confusing, so vague, so slippery, but that's exactly, isn't it, the way the UN likes it? I, I think that one of the reasons this text is so slippery, so difficult to understand, is that they're trying to make everyone happy. They're trying to get a text that the gun control enthusiasts can say, ah, look, we've, we've achieved something here, and then they're trying to get something that people who want to protect the Second Amendment might look at and say, well, I'm not really sure this is all that dangerous. Maybe we can sort of live with this. It's, it's trying to please everyone. The problem with that strategy is that any unclarity will be clarified by our administration and by our courts. Unclarity is not going to remain unclear for long in the legal context of the United States, and we really cannot accept that kind of unclarity. So what do you think is going to happen here? I know most of what goes on the next couple of days is going to be behind closed doors, but come Friday, you think there's going to be a consensus? Do you think they even have a will have a final document to have consensus on? Members of the U.S. delegation are turning increasingly pessimistic when you talk to them about actually getting a treaty. On the other hand, some of the NGOs I've spoken with say they think the chances are improving. My personal view, 50-50, maybe 55-45 in favor of a treaty, but too close to call right now. You know, you don't have a lot of media coverage on what's going on here. You and I know that. We talk about it all the time. But what we see in this treaty, isn't that reason for every American to be concerned when it comes to an administration like this one who thinks the UN is a great place to decide how we should do business in America? I think, I think we should all pay more attention to foreign affairs regardless of the administration, regardless of what's being discussed. I encourage people, obviously, to defend their Second Amendment freedoms, but this is a treaty with very broad foreign policy and security considerations that will affect our armed forces, our business. Every part of U.S. foreign relations will in some way or another be affected by this treaty. It's going to be with us for a long time whether we sign it or not. And therefore, I think we should all pay attention to it regardless of how we feel about the Second Amendment. It matters to everyone. Ted, you know, if, if they don't have consensus Friday night at midnight, what happens? <laughs> well, all of a sudden the clock rings and the coach turns back into a pumpkin, I guess. Uh, no, what happens is that if there's not consensus, it's quite likely that the president of the conference, Ambassador Moritan, will go back to the UN General Assembly and ask for a renewal of his mandate to keep on negotiating. And there, there would then be a second ATT conference, maybe in January, maybe next summer, it's hard to say, at some point in the future. If the ambassador felt that it was absolutely hopeless, he might quit. Unfortunately, if that happened, you would probably get an arms trade treaty written outside the United Nations by a lot of well-meaning but uh, confused uh, nations. And that arms treaty would be guaranteed to be very bad indeed for the United mm -hmm. States because we wouldn't be in the room at all. So a lot at stake, no matter how you look at it. Absolutely. Alrighty, thanks so much. Thank you.